Hello, everybody. We have Mark Ripkin of Commodore Business Machines as our honored guest today at the Commodore Los Angeles Super Show. So uh, thank you, Mark, for coming, and we hope to hear lots of good things from you. Hopefully, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I worked at Commodore from like 89 to when it closed in 94. You know, I, I didn't design the motherboards or the computers, but I you know, worked along with all the people who did and helped them either do you know, testing, support, uh, demos for trade shows, sales, and stuff like that. So I kind of got a backseat view of all the stuff that was going on and then all the stuff you hear about that went on that usually you know, is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it, when I first heard about Commodore, I was still in uh, maybe elementary school, so it's kind of hard to get a job there. <laughs> uh, but my you know, parents got me the computers over the years, and then I knew, or found out that Commodore was in my backyard. I lived in Pennsylvania, so it, it would be easy to get a job at a place that's only a few miles away. But I had to get a carpool, so I had to find someone at Commodore who could pick me up in King of Prussia, which is like near <laughs> Westchester, and then they could take me the way until I got my car. <laughs> How old were you when you entered Commodore? Like 1920. Oh! <laughs> yeah, I was trying to get my first job there. Yeah. yeah, I've been using it ever since. To do, I, I was like writing basic programs to do my own math homework before that. Before I knew that was not a good idea. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, this is where it all started. A little bedroom thing. So you can see I've got the 64 quick shot and the other. It's a great one over there. Wait, I think I have it zoomed in a little bit. The great one there. I forget which joystick that was. And the Coleco joystick, which makes nah. it a joystick. <laughs> um, let's see what I have here. So one of the things I ran into with, with Commodore equipment is um, I went I kind of broke it a lot. <laughs> Especially like you know, on the user port, there are two pins you use. If you short it, you can reset the computer easily instead of powering it down. And I always used to accidentally hit the wrong button, hit the wrong pins, and blow it up. But then when we went out to return it, um, there was a, used to be a store chain called Best. And they're like, oh, we don't have 64s anymore. We have this 128, so do you want that instead? Like, okay. So you can see it says, like, you can exchange. They just gave me a 128 for a 64. Wow. Thinking, you know, it's all Tom Blair, so there you go. Mm. That was nice. <laughs> um, you know, eventually I upgraded to Amiga when I saw that was coming out, but that was too expensive for a high school kid, so I had to wait until it was a little more affordable. Um, this is Downingtown Computer Center. Downingtown is near Westchester, so you can see the prices for things like, uh, I think I'm going to go one there, like 550 for the Amiga 500, uh, 197 for the floppy. It says 1.2, bro. Yeah. 1.2. Well, what, did yeah, come out with three two. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. one two was out yeah. for a bit before one point three. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, my computer. Oops, <laughs> sorry. If I hit the uh, swipe. Oi. There we go. I have my computer at Penn State, ah. which is our link to Commodore. A lot of Commodore employees went to Penn State, so they helped me get a job there. <laughs> but I had a two thousand, so that that was when I had already started working at Commodore, and you could go to the company store and buy equipment at cost. So you think like an Amiga 2000 was like $2,000 or something, but I got mine for $700. Nice. <laughs> hmm. That was nice. Uh, at Penn State, uh, Commodore was trying to get into education, so they donated uh, about 20 or 30 Amigas to the lab, to one of the engineering labs. The engineering department didn't know what to do with Commodore computers. The, you know, the IBM was very long trench there. Apple was very established. Um, Apple played hardball. They were they were the meanest representatives in education. Um, they went so far as to, when we, there was a good computer demonstration room where you could have all these platforms. They had you know, PCs and Macs and Amiga. They would take the Amiga and just put it in a closet somewhere. Oh. And show up like, where did someone steal it? Oh no, they just moved it. And we had to put it back again. <laughs> then they changed, they got the IT department to change the approved vendor list so that Commodore couldn't be on home. They were just playing all sorts of tricks there. But this group in the engineering college, uh, we had like 20 or 30 Amigas. We, the students took over the class and we taught the class. So we had, had access to a whole room full of computers. We could do graphics, we could play games, whatever. Uh, we did a bunch of fun projects. One of the ones we did was set up by uh, like one of the staff members who had connections in the art community. 
to make a video. It was like a combination of commemorating the 500th anniversary of Columbus with the launch of a competition to design spacecraft powered by solar wind. <laughs> Put those two together, and we made a promotional video all on the Amiga Lab there using all the equipment there to put together. And uh, that's where I learned how hard it is to do real 3D animation. Up until that point, you know, I, if I, you could fire up like a Skull 4D or Imagine and render one frame and it would take like an hour or two. <laughs> but we had to make a whole video. So we enlisted like the local TV station to, do rent, to rent time there. And you had to record it one frame at a time. Oh. The way it worked back then is it would roll the tape back, start rolling at speed, huh? and then record a frame. And then go past, then rewind it again, and go back again and record the next frame. Oh. And <laughs> it, that would take even longer than it took to render. That's how animation was done back then. And it was kind of a flaky protocol, so every once in a while it would just stop. And you don't, you don't know what frame it was on. So we have to like check in on it all the time. Like if you're running it during the day, you have to keep going check, is it still working? <laughs> to make sure that it was still doing its thing until it finished rendering the whole animation. And also, back then, you know, all those uh, Amigas they donated, they had only the, I want to say, 20 or 40 bank drives, and ST506 drives. So there wasn't enough room for all the frames. Oh. So what I mean to do is we render like five frames on this one, five frames on that one, ten, <laughs> as many as will fit. And then we just take all the hard drives out of all the computers, and take them over, and put them into one machine one at a time to render off those frames. That was a challenge. What kind of Amigas did you have in the lab? It was like a bunch of just plain vanilla A2000s. Oh, and wow. we had like five 2500s. Those were the, the, the fast, super fast machines. So it was before like the other faster machines. Because on uh, the TV show Babylon 5, I know they were using 030s yeah. in their, uh, their A, A2000s. Yeah, but they could just buy better computers. We were stuck with whatever Commodore donated and we weren't going to expand on them at all, unfortunately. And we had one Silicon Graphics in the back of the room, too, we had to play around with. It was like the same model in uh, Jurassic Park. You know, it, it, the, the interface with the, the, everything's on 3D buttons flying up. Hmm. And that machine's probably not as powerful as some of the ones in here. <laughs> uh, I didn't think of any things about that. Um, I took some notes. Let me uh, check my notes here. No problem. Lightweight, well, the preview window was always like you know, 
this big compared to this big of the screen. Mm. And we decomposited it, it probably in deluxe screen. <laughs> Stuff like that. And these, um, these craft were supposed to be launched, like folded up inside of a rocket. The rocket would take it up into orbit and then it would unfurl mm -hmm. and then catch the light waves and take off into space theoretically. I'm not sure if the, whatever happened with that competition. But we, we uh, had like a launch event at the Smithsonian in DC, and then CNN did a video about it. Were there prizes involved? Yeah, there was like a competition for, for different schools for competing. The Commodore didn't get much publicity out of this one. But there were things I did during that time that helped, that worked with Commodore, I'll show you in a second. What year was this again? This was probably like 89. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, it said 92 on that article. Oh, maybe, yeah. Okay, let me see. Or do you see, is there a date on here? I can check. I don't see a date on it. Anyway. So, um, this, this is a funny inside thing. So, while I, I, I got my first job at Commodore in the CATS division, the, the MEGA technical support, and that was, I'll show you the, how I actually got that job here. But uh, when I went to back to school, like I can't work remotely. There's no such thing as remote work back then. <laughs> so, like what can I do? Well, we have an education department. They were just starting up. And they were, they were basically hiring students to be um, like ambassadors for Commodore at college campuses. And Apple had already started doing that. Commodore was just copying them. And Apple had something called the Apple Student on Campus, oh. ASK. So, okay. <laughs> What are we going to call ours? We can't use the same thing. So we called it the Amiga student on campus, but it sounds like sock. So oh. It have the same you know, cool name to it. I don't want a t-shirt if they had one. But that's how I got involved with you know, helping Commodore stay in Penn State, because Apple was trying to get them out of there. Um, IBM didn't do much, but they just everybody used them everywhere. And all the networks were, were catered to uh, the IBM PS2. And in networks. So it just was hard to, to stay, they didn't get a foothold there and get any perception. I mean, it, ironically, the, the lab was in the College of Engineering, not the visual college. It would probably would have done a lot better there. In your job description as Commodore Amiga te Technical Support, uh, what is your j job description or what? What are you required to do? Oh, yeah. Let me see if I have that coming up. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll get there. Okay. Um, okay. So my user group. So I was active in the Philadelphia users group. So that we call it POG. Another great acronym. POG. <laughs> so POG met once a month at Drexel University. Uh, they gave us free reign of a classroom there every month. And uh, I don't remember actually bringing. Uh, maybe once in a while we brought our computers there. It was usually just mostly getting together and meet and talk about what's new. I think once in a while we got a Commodore engineer to come out and talk to us. We were, we're local, we might as well come over. Uh, but there were some really creative users in that group. I remember one guy who used to draw these color cycling paintings in deluxe paint, hmm. but he would do them in super bitmap mode, so they would be like you know, a thousand by a thousand. And it's like a giant, like one he did was look, look like a giant uh, Mediterranean like Greek city, and there's an like, aqueduct with water flowing, there's some color cycling <laughs> everywhere. And he just like, he's scrolling around, just exploring this whole thing, just in deluxe paint. Um, there's a comic book artist, and um, there's a few cool engineering people that were that were there too. So this was my, how I got work, got a job. So I. I Started going like I'll oh, there's a zoomed up version of this in a second. Oh okay. I um I was there were a couple of bulletin boards in the Philadelphia area that you used to keep in touch with with people before before the internet. Um, and once I found one, I printed it out on my Epson printer, which you know those dot matrix printers you couldn't use them at night because they were too loud. It was like Shh, really loud sound. Um, here we go. So this was the message on the bulletin board they posted. So they were trying to get people, recruit people locally a bit from, uh, from the local area. And you can see it's, oh, is there a contact person? Uh, or just send it to personnel department. If you meet at least 80% of the list of requirements, it says, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was 81, you're gonna, gonna uh, So one of the job positions was a programming position. I don't know who got that one. You can see what the requirements okay, are. We're going to get to know C and Assembler. 
And then the one I responded to was this one. So this was the support assistant temporary summer position. So I get to go on school. And this was basically um, trying to answer support questions from developers in particular, for Commodore application support. Um, usually going on Bix, like the, their, their bold support system, to look for questions that were not being answered and forward them to the developer and say, hey guys, take it, take it. Take this up and uh, answer the guy before he gets too frustrated. Mm. And then helping out with any of the other things they were doing, like uh, when they would do de developer kits to all the developers, we'd all get together in a conference room and stuff packaging folders with the disks and documentation and stuff like that. And then I, I used to help out with things like DevCon, the DevCon. I never went to one, but I got to help out all our preparations. This is just you know, the thing I happened to find while looking through the paperwork. So I went from like bagging groceries at a grocery store like three bucks an hour to 15 bucks an hour, uh, roughly about 13 and then 15 and 20 eventually. Uh, this is my su first summer PO for like 5K for the uh, summer. That was kind of neat. And I got a letter from, you know, if you're probably familiar with Gail Wellington, who was the head of that developer group. She wrote, you know, she said basically, you, know, you weren't there, but you helped out, thanks. <laughs> And I got the jacket, I left it over there, but the monogrammed uh, Commodore Amiga jacket. This is probably the subject of a lot of stories and jokes at Commodore. So they had very tight security, quote, quote tight security. You know, they, made it, they gave the impression that security was very important and very tight. Uh -huh. you know, the engineers knew how to work around everything, but <laughs> were, you, if you came in through the the front door, you went by the receptionist, but the back there were security guards who inspected all, the, all your bags and backpacks and such. And if you were bringing in the in or out, you had to fill out a property pass and write down what it was. But you know, there were jokes about how you know, people would write down, you know, 747 airline jet, and <laughs> they would just sign off on it and not even read it, so they didn't even know what was going on. Um, but the funny thing with this one is that you know, I, I was picking up some equipment that I was going to take back to Penn State, and like the color here, you can see color, it says beige, because like everything was beige, and I was like, no, I didn't bother writing it. I was talking to a guy named Mark Green, who worked in the department, and he was a designer, and he was talking about how you know, the cheapest color plastic to produce is beige. That's why all the computers were beige at the time. And he was like frustrated that we can't do any other color, because we have to do beige all the time. But here I've got a, um, what is it, like a hard drive, a 2091, an accelerator, and a, uh, 2058, that's a bridge board, right? Or is it a memory card? Okay. Anyway, that was fun. Um, <clears throat> one of the jobs they would give me, like every time I'd come in for a summer job, I'd say, okay, you know, we have DEF CON coming up, we need you to help make these graphics for the presentation. Or, uh, you know, we'd be, uh, like when I joined, they were just about to, they were getting ready to wrap up 1.3, so that was about to come out. And they were pretty excited about that because 1.2 was, very unstable, apparently. Um, but they were, were making a whole new set of manuals for the developers, the ROM kernel reference manuals. And um, you know, here's the, like, the legal page here. And you know, just to show, I, I was there, really. <laughs> like one of the many names stuck in there with all the other people. <laughs> but um, these pages were, were, became a joke because there was so much text on it. Who, wow. you know, who really bothers to read it? You know, wow. It was submitted to the legal department. They have to proofread it. And so one of the guys who was kind of a prankster, you know, like um, Bryce Nesbitt, who would always play jokes on other engineers, he decided to put something on the page and see if anyone would notice. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, oh, I'll share that in a second. This is a diagram I did for the Amiga. But, uh, so on the uh, includes one, there's the legal page. And if you look closely, you see that? Oh. <laughs> oh. That was funny. That, that made it to the made it to print. Not in the second edition after that, but the first one that went out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there were some unintentional errors. There was a, a very small, thinner manual for uh, Mega DOS, and it mentioned that like there's a program for editing sectors called Disket, and there's a famous line that says disk that have to be inserted to be edited by Disket. Like, how would you do that? Doesn't seem possible, but it was in there. Um, okay, another project I worked on. This one I can't um, zoom in, but it looks big enough there. So there was a, another person at Commodore named Robert Edgar. He worked in the marketing department. 
and he was going after the professional creative industry. So he produced a video and marketing material to go after like video production people. I mean, he was one of the few people that got it. Like, okay, the video toaster is kind of popular. We should maybe capitalize on that. If we're not gonna do games, you know, we're not gonna succeed going up against IBM on spreadsheets or going up against Apple for this pure drawing design, but video is, it should have been the niche they would go for. So he produced a video where he pulled together work from actual users. Hmm. So it wasn't just a, you know, the, the Stevie in the bedroom or uh, you know, that commercial. It was real customer work pulled together. I, I gave him some my 3D animations, and so I helped out with, you know, getting, collecting the stuff and then helping edit it all together because it was a lot of stuff, you know, to, to sort through to find the best of the best. Um, this is another letter I just happened to find. So after school and support, you know, I'm still trying to find, okay, where's my next job going to be? I worked for sales. So sales typically would pair up a technical person with a salesperson. Um, so I was paired up with a guy who was the Northeastern Regional Sales Manager. He was responsible for all the Amiga dealers in like Pennsylvania, New York, and around that area. And they just they had a letter about, you know, 93 is going to be a really great year. <laughs> uh, this I went to. Oh, look at this. So this was the launch of the CDTV. Um, to promote that, this was during, I want to say Comdex probably, they rented suite 8116, which is like one of those suites with the floor and ceiling windows, you know, that looks over the whole strip, and has a laser. So they had a, the CDTV logo spelled out in lasers. Uh -huh. And then uh, one of the marketing guys came out dressed like Julius Caesar, like with the, the skirt and the sword and everything. That was, <laughs> let me see, I'm gonna check something next here. Let me go, okay, let me go back. Okay, so I'm not sure if it's in there, so I'll mention it now. Like, so at, at Commodore, you know, they went through a lot of upper management. At one point, you remember they brought in the guy who used to work at Apple. Um, what's his name? Copperman, hybrid parent Copperman. And we thought, okay, great, we got Apple's marketing knowledge in Commodore. Like, this is gonna be a great match. And the first thing I noticed that when they gave a presentation internally, that was a, actually, was a, at first it seemed good because he was actually gonna tell us what they're gonna do to the employees. They didn't, we're just gonna go out and run an ad campaign and then we find out later by watching it on TV. They wanted to show us what their plans were. So this is the Stevie commercial era. But when they went to give their presentation, they used oh, an overhead projector. So they brought in one of those old-fashioned overhead projectors with the transparencies, mm -hmm. and they put down slide one. And everybody in the back is like looking at them, well, do you know that we actually made something that, that does that? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a, a sign that maybe they were still too far removed from what they were selling. And then we found out, you know, they, they had, you know, just to make up numbers, you know, they had an $11 million budget. They spent $10 million to make the commercial. And they had no money left over to actually run the commercial oh. on TV. Oh. <laughs> like, you know, spread your money out a little bit better. But it's all right. You know, they, were, they, were, they were obsessed with making the best possible stuff and didn't realize it cost money to run the ad afterwards. <laughs> Did that advertisement ever get released? Or? Well, that, that, was, that was two campaigns. There's the Stevie in the bedroom one with the Sorta and you know, all those little famous celebrities. And there was another video they did, the, that series, like the Amiga 500 one. But the, they, they were high budget for Congress budget, but the, they didn't realize, like, after you make it, you actually have to pay to play it on the TVs on the channel, so. so. it was just buried? It was just out there. Okay. There was no place to run it. Like, oh, they, okay. they just weren't given a chance to, uh, to use it. And then they, they, they came out with these, they received the, what I, I call the, the Bob's Big Boy campaign. I mean, they, they, were, they were trying to sell Commodore to business, so they used like this 1950s era cartoon character. Because hmm. they're across between Bob's Big Boy and maybe Monopoly. Yeah. Like, like if you're a business, you want to be taken seriously, you don't use a cartoon. Those are the days. I want to think about CDTV, so um, I was in the support department, and there was a political shakeup while I was away. When I came back, everyone's gone. Oh. <laughs> Most of the people are gone. Or, or in the process of, of going to other departments or leaving the company. And Gail Wellington was basically pushed, away, pushed out. They said, okay, well, instead of being head of the cats, you can now get your own department, we'll call it special projects, which is undefined. 
But that, the first project was CDTV, so she was responsible for managing the, everything from getting engineering to make something, to marketing it, to producing it, and getting uh, uh, developers to support it. Um, and this is back when CDs were just coming out. I mean, they had been out for audio, but not for computers. So we had a Meridian CD burner, which is about the size of a dishwasher. The oh. whole. And it had its own proprietary operating system. And the blank discs were like $20, $30 a spot. And so if you blew, you blew it, you just threw $20 out the window. So you had to be pretty careful in which, how many times you would make a blank disc. And it was complicated. You had, because the Meridian was on its own operating system, we had to like build an ISO image on the Amiga, get it to the Meridian, then have to convert it to some other format, and then you could burn it, and that would take like 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is just before CD burners were viable on uh, desktop computers. Uh, uh, also, um, to promote the CDTV, um, they made a promotional video, which is supposed to be like this, like, to make it seem really cool and uh, hot. So one of the engineers, knew one of the band members of Pink Floyd and he got him to do like this music track with like guitar and saxophone and they showed it to Irving Gould, the, the investor, and they said, what do you think? And he just said, too loud. And they said, so can't use it, sorry, it's just too loud. Oh. And that was it. I don't think we ever used the video. Oh. Huh. Uh, let's see, the watch party. Uh, so I did some work for GBP, because they were in Pennsylvania too, <laughs> kind of in the backyard. Uh, GBP made all these peripherals, you know, I had an accelerator from them. And they had seen some work I had done using uh, like a free version of Scala that was put out there to promote the company. And so I did a promotion that was like for a bunch of their products, like their EGS and their phone pack and accelerator and stuff like that. And they would use it at, mostly at trade shows or when they would go out to visit audiovisual dealers, they'd set up a machine and run it. But that was a fun thing to work on. I found a bunch of business cards. Let's zoom in on this one. Let's see, does it work? Oh, oh wait. Me? Okay, I'll just do it in the. So these were people that I had managed to get a business card from while I was at Commodore. Ironically, I don't have my own. Yeah. But there's a sales guy, John Gray. So this up, this guy, Warren Shigursky, he was the dad of one of my high school friends. I didn't realize it. Like, my friends are, have parents that work at Commodore because it's in the neighborhood. And he was one of the chip designers on the AAA chipset that never came out. Oh, um, probably familiar with Carolyn Shepherd, uh, Tom Herman. These are all mostly salespeople. Uh, Ken worked in networking. <laughs> and then I went to the uh, Emmy Expo. So I think it was at this Emmy Expo. I was walking down the aisle and I saw a face that looked really familiar. Like, you know, when you spot someone who you never met, but they look like they look like someone. And I looked at his badge, and his badge said, Tell her. I'm like, Hi! And he actually said, Hi. <laughs> well, but he doesn't talk. He kind of tell her. He said, Hi. Hmm. And some more Amiga business cards. Uh, let's see. Up here at the top here, Chris Green was at. Commodore, who was a graphics guy, he wanted to do game development. Uh, Eric Levitsky worked for Commodore, but not as an employee. He was like the longest running contractor who everybody thought was an employee, but not, but didn't actually ever become full time. Uh, Media Innovations was a Scala and Commodore dealer in, in Toronto. They did awesome 3D stuff. Hmm. They're, they're a graphic designer. Actually, they did both music and uh, 3D, so they did uh, I wish I had some of their art. Well, I mean, they made their business card in 3D, but uh, the guy did some stuff that looked like it would have been made today and back then. Uh, New Tech, interactive stuff. Doug, Doug Peter at St. Clair Interactive was like a big, uh, in, in leading edge interactive touchscreen kiosks. Mm. This guy, Tura Coleman, was the cartoonist that was in our user group. And I went to this few, these are some of the Amiga dealers. So Industrial Color Labs in New York was a Amiga dealer. And so was Computer Basics in Pittsburgh. And uh, Microworks, where were they? Uh, New York as well. Let me see here. And he's in South Africa. Uh, there's one here that I don't have, that's too bad. Um, with the, these Amiga dealers, the salesperson I was paired with, he would take me out to a place, you know, and then we would talk with them and figure out what they were 
needs are as far as copper or technology or whatever. And then I would come back and sometimes help them get started. I mean, if you just give them the computer, that's one thing, but you gotta help them do what they're trying to do. So we had everything from, there's an army training base that was using Commodore 64s to do the targeting. So they would be like dynamic targets with little pop-up soldiers showing up <laughs> behind hills. And they used, the rifles were mounted with light pen. You know, they uh, uh, a uh, LED light pen, so you could tell where you were shooting. Uh, we did some stuff for car dealers, and uh, then the, the biggest effort that we did, that we undertook, was um, he went to visit all of his, as many of his uh, Mika dealers as he could. So we started in Pennsylvania, I should have done a map up here. We started in Philadelphia, we drove up through Penn State, which is the middle of Pennsylvania, to uh, Erie and then to Niagara Falls, and then drove straight across New York, stopping at dealers along the way, across the bottom of New York until we got to New York City. And this was during like, one of the worst snowstorms oh. of that time, that decade. And we, we were driving where we couldn't see like five feet in front of the car. We just, just hoped that we were going in the right direction and we're still on the road. That was a touch and go. I thought I had the picture of me. Oh yeah, that's just coming up. All right, so uh, more people. So, so then there are people that you know, I idolized because I, I did a lot of 3D stuff at the time. I was a you know, big fan of Lightwave. One time at a trade show, I saw a guy dressed all in black sitting at the booth, kind of minding his own business, and I sat down, and it was Alan Hastings, who created Lightweight. Oh. I try to pick his brains on stuff and see what he's working on. Um, but so some of the people I ran into were, um, you probably recognize Jez Sam from Argonaut, who did all the 3D type games, and he went on doing, uh, is it called Star Fox on Nintendo? Mm. Uh, Roman Normandy as Caligari. Another person who was just like sitting, a lot of times, it, 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 these like celebrity kind of people, it's celebrity in the industry, you know, they're kept behind closed doors, they're having lots of meetings, but eventually they take a break and sit somewhere and get a drink. And like, Robin Murray was just sitting on the stairs. So I said, hey, I recognize your face from like magazine articles. And he was telling me, like, Caligari, has anyone ever used or seen? It was, its interface was way out of its time. I mean, the Lightweight and Sculpt 40 were good, but Caligari was like, it, it, like in Sculpt 40, if you put a circle onto a sphere onto the page onto the, to the environment, at that point it forgot it was a sphere, it's just a bunch of points. And if you accidentally did something to it, you'd warp it and mess it up and it's gone. But Caligari like kept track of all the geometry and you could even take like objects and weld them together and it would maintain their original actual shape together as one one piece. Uh, let's see. Hash animation, that was another animation program. So this guy, his stuff got used to do like the um, Dancing raisins, I believe. Could be wrong. The California raisins commercials, but maybe that might have been claymation. But he, his animation tool was used a lot in TV. Um, this guy I met much later, Ben Wagner. Uh, he's a video compression pioneer. I think he works at Microsoft now. And then this guy, another one I met much later, probably like in the last decade or so, where. I was invited to a sales meeting, and the company is called Resonate. They're, they're like they were one of the pioneers of 3D animation for commercials and movies. And this guy in particular, uh, Bill Kovacs, he he created Wavefront, which was like one of the first commercial 3D animation programs. And you know, the, the person I was with, like, okay, you know, can you hand out some business cards, or whatever. I'm like, hey, you're the guy that made Wavefront. He's like, oh, no one ever notices that anymore. And here's some stuff I rendered in the uh, lightweight. Or this was actually, no, that was maybe the first thing I did in Turbo Silver. I put a sphere on the ground and checked with a flat background and did render and come back in an hour. Uh, this I did in lightweight. It's like a 3D city, like a Blade Runner kind of thing. Hmm. This was, I actually did animate it. I was able to animate it because it's so dark and the only objects moving were like this helicopter over here. It didn't take forever to, to render out like a 15 second piece of it. And then this, that was a still image. No, I think I did like a camera fly around it. I tried to do my own Terminator 2 face. <laughs> nice. well, this is like what taught me, like, this took me like a long time to put together to get the geometry because I had a 3D head and then I had to like take off the face, put it onto a plane, and then weld it to the floor. Hmm. All at, you know, 640 by 400. <laughs> um, and then when I hit render, it took like an hour. Like I couldn't, I didn't have the patience to like see how I could do anything else with it other than make a still image. 
I did some more stuff. Like once I got once I got a faster computer, I was able to do more like the Toasterine. I kind of copied that Pixar Listerine commercial, and I did some promos for Robo Commodore where I turned the Commodore logo into a spaceship. That was fun. And uh, New Tech. <laughs> knew a few people there. So this is a funny New Tech. Uh, so you can tell here. There go. I'm gonna zoom in. Yes. So that's that's me in the corner. Uh. But sitting there is a Kiki, yes. who is like the face of New Tech. Kiki Stalker. But do you see who else is in this scene? It's hard to tell who that guy is, who's kind of standing kind of casually. Uh. That's Will Wheaton. Oh, wow. <laughs> So they went on like a sales tour for New Tech, huh. and they they teamed up with like the local AV dealer of the area. So in Philadelphia, there's a company I think it's probably the Lerover, who did all the AV integration for Philadelphia, and so they <clears throat> they showed up at this you know hotel convention thing, gave their speech. It was kind of weird seeing you know, Wheaton. He didn't really say anything. He was just there. <laughs> But he did, he did help out with the marketing of uh, like the toaster back in the day. Uh, and then there's some projects I worked on, an interactive touchscreen. So this, this was like way back before, you know, modern tools to make these kind of things. I did this in Amiga Vision. And it was, uh, what they had done for, you know, ahead of time is they had got a guy with a video camera to go from wherever the heat house was going to be and walk to all the departments with the camera. So that when you went to a location, and you're looking up, you know, Dr. Ron Jones, you'd actually see a video going up the elevator, walking down the hallway, and it all playing this off a laser disc on the uh, keyboards. Yeah. That was fun. And I have a Mika 1200 spec sheet. Here's, okay, so remember that sales tour I was telling you about? <laughs> I don't know why we chose this location. <laughs> it was fun. Um, <clears throat> Because the 1200 was in a short supply, there were maybe only like <clears throat> two or three models, physical models that were available. We got one of them, so you know we had one of the rare production models of the 1200 in the U.S. before they were in production you know, for consumers. So I mean, we were driving around and we saw this store. Like it looks like a fun place. It's like a picture with the 1200. <laughs> were you driving that pickup truck? No, we, we had a rental car. I used to clip articles, and the Philadelphia Inquirer covered Commodore a lot because it was local. So I got to know that they, they, this one's written by Anthony Ganako, Nafo. Yeah. And there's a few other people that were, that would, that was their beat to cover up the Commodore technology story. And this was like when the 4000 came out. So I, I had a 4000 at one point with the Supergen card. Did anyone hear the personal animation recorder? Mm -hmm. Car. So it was a hard drive that stored only video, but it stored it at broadcast quality. So you couldn't put any files on it, but it was designed to output like video that was per didn't skip frame. It wasn't like an animation, like a quick time. It was like video, it was almost using the hard drive as a tape, as a video tape machine. And then I had the Studio 16 audio card, which was had slightly better audio than the Amiga 60-bit audio. And then Scala, which had control at, uh, modules for all of these. So there's a video that I can pull up later that, you know, once you load it up and press play, you, you're seamlessly dissolving between animated stuff in Scala, like either anim files or Scala transitions, and then live 3D video and live video. And there was a, an AV demonstration we did uh, where they had, the one company invited like uh, Commodore and other companies, you know, that do audiovisual presentation tools and hardware. And the last one that was up was like, it was sort of graphics. <clears throat> they had this stuff playing, but it was like choppy. It was really cool, but it wasn't, you know, for the workstation that you could actually afford, even you know, that machine couldn't do like 30 frames per second video. It was like 15 for all the 3D stuff they were showing. Hmm. So then I, you know, wheel in my 4,000 with all these cables coming out the back, hit play, and at the end, people were looking under the table like, you have to have a TV. Is there a, like a tape machine under there? <laughs> Like, no one believed that it was possible. <laughs> uh, this is the brochure that was produced by the, the marketing guy I was talking about earlier. So there's um, you know, actual customers that they profile in here. This one, he's a, a doctor, teacher, medical, medical professor at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, basically spinal medicine. 
and he made this award-winning uh, interactive <coughs> horseware on, on his spine. So we went out to see him, because uh, he's local to Pennsylvania. And he told us, oh yeah, my office, just go up to the third floor, and I'm right across the lab. Just go across the lab, and my office is in the back. So the two of us <coughs> walk in the lab, and open the door, and it's kind of dark. And it's all these like, <coughs> lab tables. You think about like um, <coughs> high school lab tables, like you know, the <coughs> dark slate lab, uh, lab, I don't know what it's called, marble. <coughs> Sorry. And um, but they're, they're they're lab tables that are done for like looking at stuff. And if you're doing you know uh, medical education, you might be looking at the human anatomy. So it was literally a room full of cadavers, like as big as this room. And there's the office there. So the two of us like ran as fast as we can. Oh, <laughs> past the cadavers to get to the office and see him. And then when we were done, he kind of walks out with us, and he's walking casually past him, like kind of <laughs> power walking behind him. Like, can we get out of here? This is really creepy. <laughs> smells like formaldehyde. Oh. And there's a few others in here. I have, I have the brochure, so you can look at these guys. They're all, you know. People doing professional design or graphics. The back of this is actually kind of interesting. So you can see, like they they, they um, gave the information of like who was in the brochure. So you get the College of Medicine up there. Um, you probably recognize some of the developers. There's the Great Valley Products. And it's our King of Prussia address, they hadn't moved yet. Uh, Art Department, Professional, 80 Pro, and uh, Studio 16, Video Toaster, Opal Vision. Anyone have an Opal Vision? Mm -hmm. That was a kind of a neat car. And of course, the time-based corrector, that was like the one missing piece of my super mega kit setup, because I couldn't do proper video production with it because you couldn't link in with another like, outside deck. I had to just do everything off the personal animation recorder and the, and the Super Gen. But eventually, I mean, they were kind of expensive. I think they were about $1,000 back then, the TBC wow. parts. Wow. So it took, and once I finally got one, I could do more real advanced video production with like a Betacam deck, but uh, by then it was too late. I was doing other stuff. Then you could just do digital video. So I tried to get Commodore noticed, you know, not just at Penn State, but I wrote like, a letter to uh, Work Perfect. Because they had a, a um, version, but they discontinued it. So they wrote back saying, yeah, sorry, your market share is too small. Oh. <laughs> at least they wrote back. <laughs> and there was a magazine that was popular back then called New Media. And they said the same thing. Like, we're going to focus on Mac and PC. Sorry, oh. you know, it's too small. But we, had, we read an article about the video toaster last month. Did you see that? Thanks. <laughs> um, then this happened. So uh, as things were going south, and it wasn't just stockholders. It was, it, if, if you knew, you know, why things were happening the way they were, you kind of knew. Okay, there got to be something we can do about it. And we, and we worked in, with the viewers that worked at Commodore could see there's a lot of waste going on that could be cleaned up. Just inefficiencies. Um, they're slowing down on coming out with new products. You know, there's Christmas coming up. And, CEO is still getting paid $3 million a year. And what's going on? So we bought stock certificates and tried to contact all the other shareholders and tried to get people to band together and collectively vote to get the board to do something uh, proactively and not wait for the next quarter to come out. That's what they would, they would like send some commands out to the team to make stuff. And then in the, if the sales weren't good, they would come back with criticisms. But if the sales were OK, they, they didn't know why it was easy. Uh, they, they were so out of touch. You know, the, the two top guys, they never visited Westchester. You know, they live in uh, New York City. And at one point, you know, one, of, one person I used to work with, he went to visit them, and there was a problem with their computer. He said, well, let me take a look. And he sits down at the keyboard, and the, the guy was like shocked. Wait a minute, you actually know how to use a computer? Don't you have someone to do that for you? So that was uh, part of the reason why it just never uh, took off more than it could. He went from one year of making a billion dollars to being negative 200,000 in debt. And they started not paying bills. So that was bad. They went, don't pay bills at this vendor for chips or floppies or whatever. They won't 
didn't do it anymore. But before that, I remember sitting down with another guy, and he was looking at uh, the screen, I guess I was showing um, the like incoming orders that Commodore was making. So Commodore would order everything from office supplies to hardware components. And he said, do you realize like, we're one of the top purchasers of floppy disks in the world? Because mm -hmm. of all the disks that go in, you know, work, you know, workbench, locale, fonts, all those things, plus all the other stuff they made, they were buying all, all the more disks than almost any other company just to build all that stuff. So I bought my own stock. I only had two hundred uh, shares, <laughs> but it's enough to uh, enough to vote and to go to. So uh, where do I have it here? I don't think I have it with me. I, oh, here it is. So I, I picked up a matchbook. This is from the uh, Life or K Club in the Bahamas. So what they did to kind of make it harder for other shareholders to get involved, they they moved the shareholder meeting probably from New York City to the Bahamas. So then you get to travel internationally, and you, and you had to get into a club that's exclusive. How do you get into, you know, so I mean, we were, the two or three of us, we were young, still in our early 20s, and like I didn't even know you had to bring a passport with you. <laughs> so this is at a time where I, we show up at the, uh, the gate, and they're like, everybody have their passports out. And we said, we don't have ours. They go, all right, hold on a second. And they, they made some talk. They, okay, you can just go. No passport. <laughs> <laughs> And then we did the same thing when we got to um, the Life of Cake Club. You know, we dressed in business suits, so we looked serious, and they let us in to go to the shareholder meeting. <laughs> yeah. But it, it was all in, in vain because the top people, the top investors of the company, that owned way more shares than any other single investor. So it was really challenging to get any kind of voting power. We just had to go to the shareholder meeting and just implore them to do something different. But how do you, you know, if, if you're still getting your $3 million paycheck, it's not that. Uh, we tried, we made a, a demo using a early version of Scala, we call it the Commodore Shareholder Movement to kind of give people ideas on what Commodore could be doing and such. But um, that actually just, that helped me get a, they worked for GDP. <laughs> then, then things started to go south, uh, a lot of people got laid off. In fact, I remember at a, at a uh, trade show, someone got fired and he wasn't terribly sad. <laughs> Huh. And someone told me later, said, yeah, because he got a severance package. <laughs> later, you know, they wouldn't have enough money to do that. So if you got fired early, you got something to help you on the way out. Um, you know, Commodore owned a building that was originally uh, a factory. I think it made greeting cards and packaging, printed material. So when they bought the building, it, you know, it was ready to go. It had a huge warehouse, factory lines, everything. Uh, and you could just watch the inventory slowly get smaller and smaller and some of the office start emptying out. You know, it's a shame, like, there are only videos out there. You got the deathbed vigil, and there was another video that's like a day in the life one that was done in 89. So that's only only two snapshots of, of what the company was like back then. But, it, you know, between those two, you know, a lot of good stuff happened. Um, one of the funny things is that when Gail Wellington got special projects, they put her in an office that was kind of adjacent to the production factory. So you had to walk in and then go out into the production floor, stay, stay in the little tape lines away from the machinery, and then you go up to the office. And for whatever reason, they painted the walls of this office like a bright pink. And every time you walk in there, it would just hurt your eyes to like, look, you have to, you have to adjust, almost like coming from a dark movie theater to the outdoors. You're, you're just shield yourself for a while until you become colorblind. Uh, so, let me see, I mean, anything about Commodore before I go on to Scala. The Scala overlaps a little bit. Oh yeah, I was telling somebody about the liquidation. So, you know, they, 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 sold, they sold the lease to the building. I mentioned QVC took over, and now QVC owns the Commodore building. And I wonder if you took the tour, do they have any, like, you know, commemorative... This used to be a computer company, I don't know. Uh, but they, they were trying to liquidate, you know, make, make as much money as they could, which is not much at all. Uh, on anything, any assets that Commodore had, because they owed lots of money, and they they put a uh, financial investment company in charge of like figuring out, you know, how much money can we pay, and then just start paying off uh, debtors. Of course, the shareholders never got anything. Um, but I remember when we got there, they had opened up all the um, what do you call it, the, the back loading docks, so you could just crawl into the back of the warehouse, and it was like ten dollars for any computer, five dollars for any monitor. <laughs> just take as much as you want. Oh. Wow. And that, that even applied to like the, the, CAD, the expensive like CAD design systems. Like oh. someone said, oh, this Sun's workstation? Oh, yeah, $10, just take it. Oh. So a lot of stuff made it out that day. You know, 
eventually, I think, got in the hands of the people that worked on the, 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 uh, the new Amiga stuff that has come out in the last you know, year or 10 years. Otherwise, it would have been just thrown in the dumpster. I think. There's a lot, yeah, a lot of neat memorabilia that I wonder either just using a lot, sitting in someone's garage or <laughs> someone's office. Mm. I don't know. Let's see. So, Scala was one of the top presentation programs on the Amiga. And at one point, it was bundled with the 3000. And it, it started off as uh, kind of two, two angles. One was a slideshow program where you could make little photo slideshows and video titling and stuff like that. And then they had this other one, which was like a broadcast system where you could make like a hotel channel for the guests or a cable TV channel or maybe corporate. But back then, the flat screens didn't exist. So if you were doing any kind of corporate television channels and TVs, you had to get a large TV, and a large TV was expensive and it weighed a lot. Um, you know, even like a, maybe a 30-inch TV would weigh 100 pounds. You know, it'd be crazy to, to do a lot of them that way. But we did, and, and, and Scala took off in both markets. Um, you know, people making creative productions and then companies doing kind of uh, in-house video walls and retail stores doing uh, animations and videos. But at some point, you know, we realized that we're going to run out of computers to, to put this on. You know, we, we, our software depends on the Commodore computer. So we started buying uh, Amigas everywhere we could hmm. and stockpiling them. And then where companies would say, you know, we have an approved vendor list has to be, you know, X, Y, or Z, we built a case around the Amiga, like a black box, and said, oh, it's not a computer, it's our clients. Just, uh -huh. Don't worry about it, your IT department doesn't have to approve it. Just oh. Plug it in. <laughs> but it went on a different network anyway. It probably wasn't compatible with anything else. Um, and then trade shows, so, so around, I guess, 95 is when things started to really have to, we were kind of being forced to move to another platform. The only other viable platform was, um, well, this is before 95, was Windows 95, it not yet. So it was, it was Windows or DOS. So we ported to DOS and used the same um, techniques that video games use. So we used like a, a Remember the terminology? It's like a, yeah, the loader that you would run that would run your operating system, and they made the writer own video drivers, sound drivers, video drivers, mouse driver. <laughs> All these we built, we built to build our own operating system on top of DOS. Mm -hmm. And at one point, at one of these trade shows, uh, someone came up and said, "You know, how come you're not running this on Windows?" I'm like, well, you know, because it just doesn't have the horsepower. It can't do graphics. Mm -hmm. And the person, yeah, I know, I work at Microsoft. <laughs> these are honest. <laughs> um, and the development took a little bit longer than we wanted, so we had playback working, but not offline. So what we often do at shows like this, so behind there is a video wall. Those are 16 25-inch monitors that were a oh. huge pain to stack. <laughs> and you know, even though it was seamless, they, they didn't have the typical TV bezel, just because of the, there were, there were the uh, what do you call this? Conca convex uh, picture tubes. Right. They just stuck out so much. If you looked at it from an angle, it looked like a bunch of bubbles. But you, but you used you were, back in those days, you were used to that. But as flat screens came out, they became more natural to look at. But um, what we had to do to make that work is we had a switch box. The guy who did the presentation here had a switch box, and he would show authoring on the Amiga side, and then we had the same exact uh -huh. content playing on a PC. Uh, so we press play, <laughs> flip switch, and they say, okay, this is playing on a Windows box. Oh. Uh, they're all general. Yeah, well, I know what it was. There was a company called Imtech that made a video wall controller. And another story, that when you, the, the Imtech had a uh, proprietary connector. And they sold this adapter that was basically their connector to S-Video. So one S-Video is driving that whole Thing. And you could send it little commands to, like in this case, you could command it to mirror the same image on all the monitors or do one image across all. That was like the choice you could do. Great. Primitive video wall stuff. So good. But one time, the, the, our, our little three inch connector broke. The whole video wall is, is unusable now. Oh. So we're, this is like the day before it's set up. So we found an MTech is at the show. So we ran over to their booth, like, can we borrow your little, little adapter? Like, they, if it had been a different trade show, we would have been out of luck and have a blank video hall just because of the little proprietary connector. And then we also worked with uh, Philips. They made this screen up on top there. That weighed 250-ish pounds. It had a full 
486 PC in the box uh, with the picture too. Uh, <laughs> and I used to, that's me standing there. Like I used to stand a little bit back because if that thing fell on you, you'd probably have to go to the hospital. And they are doing demos on those CRT monitors. We also uh, had a close relationship with Intel. So when the Pentium 2 and then later the 3 came out, Scala was used as like the premier presentation program. For the Pentium 2, when it came out, we were finishing the video up until the last minute. I had to hire a courier to take the computer that I finished. I literally finished the presentation, unplug the computer, and then we had a courier pick it up at my house and take it to, um, to San Jose, to Intel, to do the presentation. And then they flew it from there to Frankfurt the next day. <laughs> I never hired a courier. It was really expensive. <laughs> And there it is. The Pentium 3 I actually got to go, so we, we went to the Pentium 3 launch. But after that, it, you know, multimedia became more commonplace, so you didn't need a special program to, you know, to promote it anymore. Now this is an added design for Scala. This, the, the area inside there, that like city, is pieces of Montreal kind of photoshopped together. Mm -hmm. We made a demo out of it. And we hired a company that was one of our customers that used Scala to do like a commercial material. And we said, you know, here's your pitch. Make a demo that would convince you to buy Scala. So you're, you really, they were really uh, critical art people. You know, they looked at everything and what message it is and how well it's produced and the quality of the artwork. And so I said, make something that would make you want to buy it. So they came up with the uh, Scala City. That was pretty cool. Then my last, like, Commodore thing was going to the 30th anniversary. Mm. Since then, I haven't really had much contact with stuff. You know, they, I should have mentioned, like, when, um, here, well, water. <clears throat> when um, Commodore went bankrupt and we started hiring uh, Commodore engineers, I think we had maybe a dozen of the key software mm. and some of the hardware people working at Scala for a while. So, like, Dave Haney, Jeff Porter, Peter Turner, uh, Scott Drysdale, Eric Quackenbush, like a whole bunch of these guys that worked on the Commodore stuff came to Scala for a while. And we did dabble in some hardware related stuff. We helped companies that made hardware make their hardware better. Um, but some of the hardware guys wanted to keep doing hardware, so they let Scala to go on to other companies like Roku or uh, 3DO or, you know, those kind of you know, video game kind of stuff, or console stuff, where they could keep doing what they liked doing. That was about it. Anything else? Anybody have any questions of things that you might have heard about Commodore that you're curious if it was true? So uh, 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 you were with Commodore until what year? Up till the very end in 94? Yeah, like, like probably a few months before the bankruptcy actually happened. You know, they closed everything down. I mean, at one point, they kind of went in waves. So like, people were getting lit off one by one over 93. Then, I forget, really, February, March of 94, a whole bunch of people got laid off, mm -hmm. and I was like the group right after that, I think. Uh, wow. But we, we knew it was coming, we just figured, okay, just when? When's it gonna happen? Because they, everybody, you could just see that we weren't ordering more parts for things, we weren't producing more products, we weren't doing any more trade shows. <laughs> so something's gotta be up. Uh, yeah. Um, Yeah, to cover most of the things in here. I remember like on the Amiga, I used to write everything in AREX. Anybody ever use AREX? The scripting language on the Amiga. I mean, that, that, any program that supported that, you could basically you could make the program do anything. And I hadn't found something like that until later on, the, on, the, on Windows, there's a language called Python, which is kind of like the equivalent to the AREX. You can do everything you can on the computer, too. Lua, you can stick a Lua into the Lua. <laughs> What else? Um, oh, here, let me find, give me a second here. So this, let's see if I can start this playing. Don't have it blow up on me. Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> but this is stuff that was like not even possible on any other platform in like one ninety two. Some of these this presentation I inherited from somebody else who had like throwing these stuff like random stock photos together, like some wood and a waterfall, like this is really put together, but animated really fast. This is a, an animation I was talking about from the guy up in Toronto, like uh, Media Innovations, he did that night. <laughs> yeah, we had these like Norwegian or European voices for most of the applications. <laughs> So this was like an interactive application and it had buttons where you could go to different products. Like that's this ETS Spectrum card. Mm -hmm. But like it, it, the demo had everything usually in this little window because it was it made the animation smaller. You know, to make a large full screen animation which took longer to render. But for special cases it would do stuff where it would break the screen and come out.
And then we had an animation tool as part of the Scala software that would make a, a different compression from Deluxe Paint. Like Deluxe Paint was not very efficient, it was pretty big, and so we had another tool that would, after you made your animation, you could run it through this anim lab and spit out an optimized animation that would play even smoother. Or uh, more frames per second. Anybody have any more questions for Mark? Uh, Mark, can people go over and play with your machine that has Scala on it? Sure, sure. I have some of the memorabilia and stuff that I collected. I try to take the like the stuff I figure that's more delicate, that's probably the paper is going to crumble in your hands, and put it into a binder here. So all the stuff like in the presentation up there, I put in this thing. Uh, let's see here, and plus some more things I mean, that I needed to include, like you know, some news clippings I'd done. Well, I'm trying to document the whole shareholder stuff. <laughs> we, we contacted, I think, the Securities and Exchange Commission because they can give you a list of all the, the shareholders. But And we sent out a letter to all of them saying, we should do something about what's going on. How many people were involved with the share buyback situation? Not that many. I mean, yeah, and there were different groups, too, at different times. I, I think we didn't know about each other. There was one employee or two that, that had gone one year and they didn't they weren't able to make an impact and then a few of us like it was probably two two or three employees and then uh, about three or four either Amiga dealers or a couple Amiga dealers and users who went the time that I went. So we, that was the biggest group of people but still like half a dozen people against someone who's got forty percent of the company or thirty percent I think he's what he owned so he, he couldn't really uh, I don't know. We, 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 we stated our case, and he agreed with us, and then nothing happened. So that's, that was the, the tragedy, the Greek tragedy. <laughs>
created by the engineers, given to the management, and reading this PowerPoint presentation, or this slide, as an engineer, I can see, like, there was information in that slide that told me that these guys were true, right? They're saying, oh, they simulated all this stuff, but they were simulating the foam damage at, like, 50 miles an hour, but they know from the telemetry or from the, the imagery that they took, it actually hit the space shuttle at like 600 miles an hour, right? But the thing is, it was in the fine print, right? It wasn't like bold in your face. So probably... They're blaming PowerPoint for that? Yes. Or the PowerPoint is fine for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. they were blaming, like, people throw just like not thinking about how to make an impact and how to give a good presentation and just throwing all the data there on a sheet and I'm just reading off the sheet and moving on to the next slide. Yeah, um, we had an atmosphere of people that didn't feel um, comfortable trying to put up, to, to say something like that, that they're responsible for canceling the whole shuttle mission. And they didn't realize, you know, they said, well, we, yeah, we simulated it, we think it's not going to work, but we don't want to say don't go. Yeah, and so yeah, eventually no one wants to, to be the person to say don't go and, and when the facts are actually saying don't go. Yeah. So this uh, this presentation was done after they went to orbit, right? They were in orbit. Yeah. So what difference does it make? Yeah, yeah the point is too late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well they could have flown up there not for another, another shot. Yeah. But it would it would have been risky. There was a brief movement a while back with presentations, like especially when the dot com where the, the whole movement was like, make presentations with no words at all, just rapid pictures. That's harder to make because for you know, an hour presentation, you probably have to make like 500 pictures. Um, there's actually, a, there's a guy in Vancouver who uses Scala to do presentations of trips that he makes to exotic locations, and then comes back and turns it into an educational show of not just the location, but him interacting with the people and the environment there, like at its high altitude and how you know, it's harder to breathe and, people that live there, there's one video where he shows like a person who lives, you know, near a base camp of Everest can pick up this giant load of, of, of packs, and then he tries to pick it up and he can't even get it off the ground. Um, or he has a chart showing how much a Hershey bar costs based on altitude. You know, at, at, at sea level, it's 25 cents, and as you go higher, and then by the time you get to like base camp of Everest, it was like, you know, $20 for a Hershey bar. Um, so he, he's really good at making these presents, and he involves the audience in it too, as, as they're going. But the, those, um, as it was those presentations, we, we, were, we were doing a lot of presentations where clients would have a fully built presentation in PowerPoint, already done, but it doesn't look so good, and they would send it to us, and we would redo it and give it back to them. It's gone. We could have redone it in PowerPoint, but we had the tools, so we give it back to them in our own format. But we would basically just trip away half the text. You know, or, or split it up. Like if there was a page that had five lines of text, we put two on one, two on the next one, or even take out something and put a photo in its place. There was another presentation we made. Uh, I can't remember. Anything Any else? other questions for Mark? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Very good. Thank you.